good Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, I will not be here Wednesday night. Brother Bob Volontari is going to continue our message in one accord in the spirit. One voice, one mind, one mission. Uh, we're going to go to uh, Fort Bragg, uh, North Carolina, to experience the coming of my first grandbaby. Aww. Amen. So you be praying for us uh, in our old car that it makes it there and back. Uh, but anyway, uh, we just pray that uh, you celebrate with us. I'll let you know. Brother Wayne's already got me the uh, pink uh, bubblegum cigars to pass out. Uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm excited. I know my wife is excited. And we're going to join together with our son and daughter-in-law on this very special occasion. All right, Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 16, is a whole passage that talks about the heart of man. Now, we're going to look at one man, and that is Cain. I want to talk to you this morning about the sin of Cain. The sin of Cain. Uh, this message here causes us to note this negative example, and I hope that we can take a warning from it. You see, because in this passage, the revelation is brought to us that Cain committed two horrible, horrible crimes. Number one, he tried to change God's worship to suit himself. He tried to change the way God had called people, or at that day, just a few, but how God had set the standard for worship. And then secondly, we all know this one for sure, is that he killed his brother Abel. Both of these crimes, that is sin, they were sin, and they were crimes of self. God's way was pushed aside by Cain. And his brother's life, his brother's life was pushed aside. While the end of Cain's sin may have been extreme, his attitude has been seen too often in our world today, this sin of Cain. Church, we need to learn from this sin that Cain committed lest we repeat it. Let's look now at our passage of Scripture, Genesis chapter 4, begin at verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. Now there was nothing wrong and these two occupations, I just want you to know. But the heart, the heart had changed. And that's important. Look at verse 4. I'm sorry, verse 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect. In other words, the Lord accepted unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance changed, or fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? And why is thou countenance, countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. See, here we're getting into the, the truth of the matter. There was something that had changed. It wasn't altogether his offering. Because we know that in the law given to Moses, there were grain offerings. They were fruit offerings. So just because Cain was a tiller of the ground, just because Cain had brought the fruit of the ground to the Lord as an offering. It isn't that God rejected that specifically, but something changed in Cain's heart. We're going to see that in a minute. And the Lord said unto Cain, verse 9, I'm sorry, I just skipped right over the whole main important thing, all right? Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wrought, and why art thou caught in this fallen? If thou doest well, shalt not 
shall thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. Verse 12. Now here's the judgment and the curse. And when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can be here, than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out of this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. Now, even in the midst of judgment, even in the midst of the murder of Abel, his brother, we see grace, folks. That is so amazing. Paul said it. He said, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In the midst of sin, we see grace. Isn't that beautiful? In the midst of your sin, in the midst of your rejection of God Almighty, whenever you were in that wayward way, there was grace. There was the love of God. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest any find him should kill him. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, that's sad, and dwelt in the land of God on the east of Eden. May God's word be a blessing to our heart this morning. So let's look together. Number one, Cain's problem was self. This is the same thing as saying rebellion. When it came to the relationship with God, Cain wanted to exalt himself in the way that he was doing what he was doing. He wanted, rather than accepting God's way, he wanted God to accept his way. And then, his brother's life. We see that when it came to his relationship to his brother, he wanted to rule over his brother. In other words, he didn't want his brother's way to be accepted by God. He didn't want his brother's sacrifice to be the sacrifice. He was a tiller of the ground, so therefore he wanted God to accept his vegetables, his produce, things that he had made with his own hand. You see the humanistic way there? God, you're going to accept it on my terms because of who I am. Rather than his brother Abel took the lamb. See, God was projecting into the future. God, even at the very beginning, was setting forth to us that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Way back then, when Abel gave the sacrifice of the lamb, God was pointing to a time when he would send his son to be the sacrifice for our sins. Let me state this, this great, obvious, negative lesson from this text. It is a sin, church, to put self before God. Can I say that again? It is a sin to put yourself before God. In other words, you say, well, Pastor, how can I do that? Well, let me tell you how you do it. Anytime that you reject what God's Word has said, then you put yourself above God. Anytime God says don't steal and you steal, you are putting yourself above God. When the Bible says don't lie, 
and you lie, you put yourself above the law of God. You're saying, God, my ways are better than your ways. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Here's the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are stunning words, and they are shocking words, and they are tragic words. Probably the most tragic text in the whole Bible. You see, because the reality is that there are people who one day will stand before the Lord, many of them who will assume they're about ready to enter into heaven, only to find out they're on their way to hell. Now, I don't want to scare you because let me explain. You see, this is the worst possible illusion that someone can have. To be mistaken about your eternal destiny. To be mistaken about your salvation. You know, I've had people email me. I've had them talk to me in a conversation. They've asked me now, hitting on religions. They'll say, well, are Roman Catholics really Christians? Or they'll pose another question. Are Protestants, I just got this in email not too long. Do you think all you Protestants are naturally always Christians? Or are, are evangelicals necessary Christians? Well, my response back to them is always this. More than important than trying to evaluate are this group or that group, are they Christians? The bigger question is, are you a Christian? Do you know that you're saved? Do you know your eternal destination? Do you know? The book of John, the Gospel of John says that these things were written. That ye might know you have eternal life. So it is possible, church. For you and I to know that we are going to heaven. But there are people out there that are deceived. Let me read to you Matthew here. Not everyone who says to me, listen, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's shocking, isn't it? Because we just think because we acknowledge the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we, that we call him Lord or that we have the uh, title of a, a Christian on our church, or we mark it on a, on a survey or whatever, yes, I'm a Christian, or we might acknowledge, yes, somebody say, are you a Christian? Yes. But the greater question is, is he Lord? Is he Lord of your life? You know, like the old saying, there's many people that are going to miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the distance between the noggin up here and the heart down here. Because you might know Jesus, you might know of Jesus, you might know the plan of salvation, you might know scripture, you might be a member of a church, you might sing in a choir, you might do all of those religious exercises, but my brother and my sister, let me say to you, if Jesus is not Lord of your heart, if you're not living your life to give glory and honor to God, then you're missing it. Well, because if you can be a halfway Christian, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm just not all the way there yet. Ladies, I use this illustration all the time. Can you be almost pregnant? You know? Somebody say, well, are you going to have a baby? Yeah, I'm almost there. You know, I'm almost pregnant, I'm almost going to have... Either you are or else you're not. Amen? Either you are a Christian or else you're not. Could be that you're among those that are self-deceived. And you're not alone. Cain, in his attitude of wanting to serve God his way and not God's way, is the same problem that we have today. I'm convinced that in the name of Christianity, there are many places that call themselves churches, and they're not churches. And, and they've been, they're being led by men Leading them who call themselves pastors who are not pastors, may I say. And they are congregations that call themselves Christian congregations, and they are not Christians. They're not churches, they're not pastors, and they're not, not Christian churches, yet they proudly post the label Christian as if some kind of word you can adopt that makes everything okay. So we look back on Matthew chapter 7. Let, let me look at verse 13 and 14. You see, there are two possible solutions here, and that is the Word of God gives us the illustration of the broad way that leads to destruction and the narrow way that leads to heaven. 
There is a narrow gate that goes to heaven, and there is a broad way that says, but goes to hell. So there are only two ways, folks, whereby you can travel. There are only two ways that you can get to heaven. Either you travel the narrow way that gets you to glory, or else you travel that broad way that's going to lead to destruction. So here it beckons the question again, are you a Christian? You, you can worry about so many things in this world, but the one answer that you have to answer, and that is, are you following the Lord Jesus Christ? Can you hear me in the back there, Brother Kenneth? Yeah, God gave me this uh, uh, built-in uh, uh, speaker box. So I'll just preach a little bit harder and a little bit louder. All right? So it's hard to find the truth in hearing it. But the fact is, is just hearing it is not good enough. You've got to act on it. You've got to have the love of Jesus Christ in your heart. All right? The true way to heaven is hard to find. I'll be honest with you. Because in this way, you have to leave the crowd. To follow the narrow path that leads to heaven, you've got to separate yourself. You've got to separate yourself from the world and worldliness. And you've got to separate yourself from worldly carnal Christians. Because they're going to pull you down. They're going to skew your mind. You know, because they're going to want to always... And I love this, and I don't understand it, but I'm going to preach about it tonight a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to preach more about the heart, all right? The troubled heart. And a part of having a troubled heart is that we set up roadblocks against our brothers and our sisters because our heart is not right. You see, everything comes down to a heart problem. God noticed this in Cain. God came in and said, Cain, what's wrong? Why is your countenance... In other words, your attitude. Why is it changed? So there was something wrong in the attitude of his heart. And so God addresses that. I'm saying that Cain had a problem in following God. He must have seen the sacrifice of the lamb. I'm sure that God had explained it to both of those boys. And it was, though his problem, I believe, was there was not enough of himself in this type of worship. You see, because people come and they want worship to be their way and only their way. There's people that want to worship God on their terms. God, I don't have to go to church to worship you. I, I know you guys have never heard that before, have you? <laughs> oh, oh, I can worship God from my living room. I can worship God, man. From, the, from, from my comfy swivel, reclining uh, bucket seat on my bass boat. Well, you all are quiet. <laughs> you, you see, we have all of those excuses. But God said not to forsake yourself to the coming together. Where to come together and worship God as a body of believers. Remember I told you, there is always strength in numbers. God, does, the devil doesn't want you to recognize that. He doesn't want you to acknowledge that. God wants you, uh, I mean, the devil wants you to separate yourself from the body of believers. He wants you to get away from church folks. He wants you to get away from the preaching of God's word. He wants you to get away from studying God's word. Why? Because he wants you to think that you can make it all by yourself. And that's what Cain's sin was. Cain didn't even think that he even needed his brother. And he didn't like his brother. And he didn't like how his brother was worshiping God. And he, what his problem was, is he, his, his attitude had changed. You see, the reason that Cain had a problem was because he hated God. Let that sink in. I think a lot of times that we have problems in the church because we've changed our attitude toward God. And so therefore we take it out on our brothers and sisters in Christ. Secondly, Cain's solution would have been an easy one. And that was to have the heart of love. Let me direct your attention to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Now, the Lord teaches this pattern. The Lord teaches the disciples and thus 
teaching us a simple plan. And that is to have God in our heart, to love God, and to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Jesus said this. Well, one day the disciples asked Jesus, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second, now they weren't prepared for this. You know, they, they had their heads not, because they had heard this before. Yeah, yeah, we're to love God. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. But Jesus adds a little addendum. He attaches that upon that, and he says this to them. This is the first and the great commandment. And the second is like unto it. So Jesus is putting this. Now, church, you've got to get this, all right? Because Jesus just now is going to attach this second commandment equal to the importance of the first. I know that's theologically hard to get your hand around, but this is the truth that Jesus was teaching. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Jesus is messing them up. Because he's saying, yes, you ought to love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. But it is equally as important that we love one another. Do you, you get that? Do you understand what the Lord is saying? When we are told that they will know that we're His disciples, that, that people in the world will recognize that we are followers of Jesus Christ, is that we love one another. You see, church, that ought to be the defining recognition of a true body of believers, is that we love one another. Yes, we love God. Amen. Amen. We love God, but we love one another, thus expressing our love for God. If you want to show God you love Him, then love your neighbor. That's what Jesus is teaching. It's radical, I know. Because in our carnal nature, in our human nature, it's not easy to love your neighbor, especially when you don't like them. <laughs> and you may go to church with them. But the commandment here is to love as you love God. This teaching here is going all the way back to the very beginning. It addresses the issue of Cain's sin. It addresses the issue of the condition of a man's heart. Jesus says the law and the prophet <laughs> hang on these two commands. So let's look carefully at that thought of loving our neighbor as we love ourselves, all right? Because somewhere along the way, Cain lost that love on these two accounts. And the reason why sometimes we as a body of believers get ourselves in trouble is because we lose our love on those two accounts. And it will always damage us. So here are some stumbling blocks I want to give you that impede our, ourselves from loving our brothers when, number one, the sin of Cain, when we serve self instead of our brothers. All right? You, you want to know why you're here in church? Well, we're here to serve one another, not to be served. D did not Jesus say that I come in the world not to do what? Not to, not to be served, but to serve. serve. And to give my life. So that ought to be our answer. You see, folks, this is one thing I'm, I'm just, I'm just soaking on the revelation that God gave me way back at the beginning of the year when I started really studying uh, for this coming year what God would have me say to you and what he would want me to preach about. It is that that whole revelation came to me. And the fact, if you know what, if we would just live according to the Bible, our lives, this church, would be totally different. If we would just obey the Bible, if we would just listen and study the Word of God and live by it, not that the devil wouldn't 
come up and try to fight us. But oh, there would be just such a peace in the midst of the storm. There would be such confidence that we would see things differently. We would begin to view things through the mind of Christ. That's the answer. Second stone we bite is that we bite and devour our brothers. I keep going back to my illustration about the gazelles. Uh, how when the lioness would come, they'd be, usually there's three or four of them, because the male lions don't hunt, all right? They're just sorry. They just <laughs> stay back with the pride. And it's the female lions that go out and get supper and bring it home. But that's lions, okay? I go do the grocery shopping, don't I? I go get the bun, grub, grub, and I bring it back home. All right. I don't kill it, but I bring it back home. But, but you see, it would be like those gazelles. And I told you how they stay alive. Because remember, the lions try to separate. But if the herd stays together, and I, if you go to, I think it would be YouTube or a Discovery Channel, they've got the, where I was watching, and I, that's weird, I know, but I, I saw about 20 of those gazelles turn back to back and split them horns, those little spinny horns, and the lions finally got frustrated and left. What happened if one of those gazelles started turning and started biting and devouring one of the other gazelles that they were standing? How, how long do you think they would stand unified? What if two of them started doing that? All of a sudden, these, these lions that are waiting for them, that can't get to them as long as they stand together, all of a sudden, they start breaking apart and setting apart. Now what happens? The lions become lions. And they attack them. And they eat them. And they're gone. And church, that's what the devil's will for you that's what the devil's will for Norwich Baptist Church. That's what the devil's will for every congregation that is meeting here this Sunday morning. He wants to have us to devour one another so that way we separate ourselves. We don't defend one another and we lay our brothers and sisters open, even ourselves, to the attack of the enemy. Oh, boy, we see so much here in Cain. Let me, let me move on. Secondly, we're commanded to love one another. Uh, turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Uh, Paul writes this. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy... Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, that's selfishness, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Whoa! You, you see that? If, if, you want to, if you want God's grace, if you want His protection, if you want the love of God bounding in you, if you want the blessings of God, I'm not saying every day is going to be sunshine tiptoeing through the tulips. But I'm saying if you want to continue growing and going with the Lord Jesus Christ, growing closer in your relationship with God, then we have to apply... The principles, if you want to see Norwich Baptist Church to grow and to survive and be a force to reckon with, to be a mission church, to be a God-saving church, to have this baptistry, not with just one getting baptized, but multitudes of people getting baptized. Why? Because they're genuinely getting saved, and then you have an opportunity to disciple them and then send them out. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. 
Now, I'm not talking about being a busybody. I'm talking about if you see your brother or sister over here struggling, if you see them battling, if you see them hurting, then, then we can't say, well, that's their problem. I have my own. That's not the attitude of Christ. Jesus lived heaven, didn't have a problem, <laughs> sinless, in glory. You see, that's the amazing thing. People, people said, I've said this to you before, I'm older now, I'm repeating myself, but it's good, all right? We look at the cross of Calvary as being the greatest challenge before Jesus Christ. And it was difficult. But as I've told you before, I think the greatest challenge before Jesus Christ was to leave the splendors of glory. To leave the splendors of glory. To come here and to deal with you and I. I wouldn't wish that on no one, would you? No. I wouldn't call anybody down from heaven to come back here just to somehow comfort me in some fashion. Or way. I wouldn't ask my mom to leave heaven for a moment, even though I've been having some mom moments where I just wanted to talk to her. And young people, let me tell you something. Better talk to your mama while she's got her. Do you hear me? I wish I could just grab her and hold her one more time. I wish I could just rub her feet one more time. I will one day. When I get to heaven. Amen. We. We sometimes. Get the spirit of Cain. Now let me give you the last point here. Cain's solution. This morning is our solution. Cain's rebellion. Manifests itself. In his worship. As it does for many of us. It, it might begin. With putting recreation. Before worship. It might begin when we come into these doors with negative attitudes and negative thoughts on our mind. You see, church, when we walk through those doors, we are walking into the sanctuary of a living God. This is the holies of holies. Do you hear me? Our attitudes, our thoughts ought to be upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Our attitudes and thought ought to be to edify and to bless one another through Jesus Christ. So I, I ask that we, that we think about before we come through those doors that if we will come and enter into his gates with thanksgiving in our heart and praise, listen, it will change how you experience church. Amen. If you're coming you say, I don't get anything out of this, then maybe you're not ready to come in here. Maybe you need an attitude. Your countenance has dropped. Maybe you're carrying some burdens that you ought not to carry. Maybe you're carrying some attitude, John. Listen, it ought to change. Leave them outside those doors, but come in here with the love of Jesus on your heart. Coming here to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Boy, I tell you what, that will change. That will change the way you experience church. Loving your neighbor as self will manifest this way in how we treat one another. I'm going to leave you with a golden rule. And then uh, I'm going to ask Jonathan to come now and prepare uh, to get ready. Brother Wendell will be back there to help you. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Dean to come if you want to the piano. And he's going to uh, play for us, and we're going to sing a good old, good old song for our hymn of invitation, and that is Amazing Grace.